just examples, and this isn't even all inclusive at all um, when we talk about types of fisheries. And these are a lot of words that um, you may hear going into fisheries, you know, like wild, wild caught, and like farm fishing or, or fish farming and agriculture. We talk a lot, or we hear a lot about when we think about our food and where it comes from and food choices. You'll hear like commercial or industrial or recreational, um, artisanal or small scale, which is generally speaking, you, you usually hear the definition of that. It is uh, usually a, like you're talking about smaller boats. Uh, usually this food is like the fishing trips not going out um, from shore as far. And you also have usually like smaller catches and it's usually that catch when it comes back to the land is then going to be distributed more locally. Um, and so that could be more for substance if that's like fishing for food. Um, so like for instance, I know the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, they actually uh, say that for substance users in their state, there's about 3.6 million pounds of wild foods that are harvested annually by rural substance users. So that's includes fisheries, but it, that's not just fisheries for Alaska. But still just to give you an idea that like subsistence fishing can have a large, large scale and small scale fisheries. There's a lot of growing research on like what that means. And that definition is like kind of um, just throughout. It, it's, it's just, there's lots of different definitions of it depending on where you are and who you are and things like that. And so, Lots of different gear types and then species as well that are commonly fished in the United States um, that will uh, do that. I see someone said cyanide. Yeah, there's cyanide and diamondite uh, and diamondite. Oh my gosh, uh, dynamite fisheries as well. Um, so that's not that's not as much in U.S. waters. That's a more international sometimes. And and um, but yeah, there's lots of different types of fisheries. It's Pretty insane. So let's go ahead and dive into some of those. Um, oh, and also we're going to talk like when I talk about location too. Not only do I mean geographic location, like if we're in the United States, whether it's like you know California or North Carolina, but also talking about like the ecosystems within our shores and like off our shores. So um, and fisheries also include freshwater fish. I'm not. I don't have a lot of experience with freshwater fish. I've Pretty much a pretty coastal person myself, but that is definitely included in this kind of management. And so it makes it even all of these different factors coming in. And so, yeah, you have your freshwater, you have your, um, and all these other like deep sea, like open ocean um, and benthic deep, uh, I said deep sea, which pointing to like, if I hope you guys were, some of you were able to uh, catch uh, Mumda's presentation on Tuesday. And if not, please keep an eye out for it. I know Virginia's gonna be sending out um, a letter to watch it, um, how to watch it later, but super interesting. She also talked about more in more depth about like layers of the ocean and things like that, and all the cool creatures that are in there. And so I want that, you know, to go back and watch that because this is very connected to that and in that section of the ocean as well, because um, we're kind of fishing everywhere. <laughs> there's fish we are we are there <laughs> um and so this is actually these are some graphics about just like some visuals of like when we talk about all these different types of fisheries um from pursane which is like that big upper left one that kind of looks like a it's like a purse essentially it's like really elaborate really big um gear that you pull things together and, or pull the nets together and kind of pull it up um kind of like a purse um, you have trawling, you have dredging, you have uh, pots and traps. Uh, you have, and even in like trawling, you can have a bottom trawl or you can have a midwater trawl or even a surface trawl. So we are going, you know, from deep sea trawling, we can do deep sea trawling at times. And then we also sometimes go to more like shallow water environments and do trawling. And sometimes we'll do more of the middle section. And it's just, it's crazy. Um, there's just all sorts of really interesting gear and uh, kind of technology that we have that we are now using to catch um, catch fish. And so, you know, with in long lines are also another um, really uh, like commonly used like fishery and as far as commercial fisheries. Um, a lot of tuna are caught on this, uh, so you'll kind of hear long lines um, often in that too. So really interesting um just kind of the, all of those different kinds of gear 
and there's even more. So then you, and this is like not all inclusive lists either. Um, and so this is just kind of more, um, when we think of more maybe recreational fisheries or more artisanal fisheries and um, local fisheries, like maybe uh, either intertidal or, um, so when I say intertidal, like in that kind of zone where uh, the water can come up um, and kind of there's low tide and high tide, and so it kind of washes up in there. So you have different kinds of species there, whether it's like invertebrates, um, which I know Katie had talked about a couple weeks ago um, on, you know, things without a backbone, so like clams and things like that are um, harvested in this kind of zone. Uh, yeah, rod and reel, hand lines, cages, um, yeah, all those kind of things. It just keeps going. <laughs> um, so, are fish species going to ex extinct from fisheries? Ooh, that's a great question. And we're actually gonna get to that too. So I'll circle back around to that. Um, these charts are just, these are good graphics from NOAA Fisheries, um, which is uh, just give you an idea of like specific to US, like where's our high volume. These are from 2018, where money is, where is there's value on what fishery, um, things like that. Um, and we're going to do a little crash course video if it's going to work. Yes. Okay. On U.S. fisheries management. When you hear the word management, you probably think of your boss, that cameraless overpaid tyrant that catches you watching videos like this. But management is necessary almost everywhere even out in the ocean. In U.S. waters, fishery management is a vital part of our economy and our food supply. For example, we have a Gulf Coast longline tuna fishery and an Alaska per seine salmon fishery. The U.S. has many fisheries that put seafood on our dinner plates, create jobs, and contribute big bucks to the U.S. economy. Sadly, fish can't attend fishery management. They tend to flop around, suffocate, and die. <laughs> and so fishery management is about how people manage fisheries, ideally while representing at least some of the fish's best interests. Fishery managers set limits on the number of fish that can be caught, along with where, when, and how. To make these decisions, they look at the size of a fish population, how it interacts with other species in the ecosystem, whether the fish needs protected areas to reproduce and grow. The overall goal is to ensure that we have enough fish to eat, and we leave enough fish to keep populations intact in the ocean healthy. And now's probably a good time to tell you your boss is looking for So a silly video a little bit um, about kind of a crash course of fisheries. That is the cartoonist for um, Sherman's Lagoon. Uh, he has a series on um, just kind of with Pew, uh, a kind of organization uh, for education outreach on different things. So um, I thought it was a interesting quick little thing about, and we're going to get more into kind of those fisheries. Um, and this is just a graph, which is just kind of showing lots of tons of fish being caught. This is from 2019. And again, this is that UN organization, that international organization, um, their stats on U.S. fisheries. And so combining whether it's wild or aquaculture. Um, so it's kind of just an interesting chart to see there. Um, yeah, so um, sorry about that, Katie. I'll make sure I'll turn, off the, uh, turn up the volume next time. Um, so yes, yeah, so just kind of giving an overview of um, just that there's a lot of fish being caught in the US. <laughs> um, and just to kind of go, to reiterate that this is just kind of in numbers to kind of give some of that and kind of those species of, you know, the volume of landings. So meaning like how much fish is actually getting to our ports and then like also the value can differ. Um, so you may see, you know, a lot of, a lot of pollock is being um, caught, but that also the, there's a higher value on lobster. So some interesting um, differences in there too. So when we talk about fisheries and fisheries management, there's um, a lot of different things in the U.S. in particular, there is one U.S. policy that's um, kind of a guiding uh, kind of beacon for how we do fisheries management. And I think that this video really summarizes this very nicely. I'll 
I'll turn it up a little bit. Asian fisheries provide many benefits. Food, employment, fun, and a place to connect with nature. Thanks to the Magnuson-Stevens Act, we will continue to enjoy these benefits today and into the future. Since 1976, the Magnuson-Stevens Act has been the primary law governing marine fisheries in U.S. federal waters. It created a system of regional fishery management councils that allows government to work with fishermen and partners to sustainably manage our nation's fisheries, which includes more than 470 marine fish stocks and stock complexes. The Magnuson-Stevens Act works to prevent overfishing and rebuild overfished stocks, increase long-term economic and social benefits, provide for abundant recreational opportunities, and ensure a safe and sustainable seafood supply. In the four decades following World War II, the annual world fishing catch quadrupled due to technological improvements and fishing vessels that could travel the world's oceans. By the early 1970s, it became apparent that such development was not limitless. Foreign fleets were scouring our waters, and fish stocks were collapsing. Fisheries such as Northeast Atlantic herring and Alaskan salmon were in serious trouble. In the 40 years since the passage of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, a lot has changed. We have ended chronic overfishing, rebuilt 39 fish stocks, and put our fisheries on solid, sustainable footing. Our nation's commercial and recreational fisheries now contribute more than $100 billion annually to the U.S. economy and support 1.8 million jobs. The Act's focus on science-based decision-making has challenged us to find answers to real-world questions about how to responsibly manage our living marine resources. During the past several decades, we made significant scientific advances, including new statistical methods for assessing data-poor stocks and remote sensing technologies to collect data on fish that were, until recently, beyond the reach of our science. Today, U.S. fisheries are globally recognized as responsibly managed under a transparent process based on science, responsive management, enforced standards, and full stakeholder participation. We have learned that there is no end point to sustainable fisheries, but it is a journey of continuous collaboration, monitoring, and adaptation in an ever-changing ocean environment. On behalf of NOAA Fisheries, Thank you to all fishermen and stakeholders who participate in the management of our nation's fisheries. Awesome. So, um, I also really like that video because I hope you noticed that there's a lot of different um, gear like that they were showing throughout that. And so there is um, kind of giving you an idea of how that all looks and um, kind of what that scale can look like too. Um, so, Really cool video, kind of giving that. Um, and so they mentioned that kind of eight, there's eight different US regional fishery management councils. Um, and so what's really cool about this is that when we talk about uh, ecosystem based management and like looking at location and why that's important, uh, this gives a, uh, a framework so that way, so like a kind of way that these people can now manage their fisheries more locally and it's involving people that are involved locally. Um, so. It's really, really great um, in, in that way. And so lots of advantages, really cool. Um, and yeah, so importance of fisheries, okay? As we, we've kind of already talked about a lot of these. Uh, food, there's cultural value, jobs, economic growth. Now these are four categories that seem like that, that's very quick and easy, but these are really big values in these um, categories. And so um, I think it's important to make sure that we highlight these and that they're are, there's a lot of importance in fisheries and then fisheries has a huge impact um, as well and both on, in these fields and um, as well as some other downsides that we talk about um, and I'm sure you guys have heard of a little bit too and talking about overfishing, um, habitat destruction and um, bycatch is the biggest one that will impact, negatively impact sharks and conservation and that. Um, and so this kind of gives you an idea of 
what bycatch is and again shows you um, some of that fishing gear. U.S. fisheries are among the largest and most sustainable fisheries in the world. But when you're fishing in the ocean, it's impossible to catch only those animals you want. Sometimes you bring up other critters like jellyfish or sea stars or species of fish that are unwanted or can't be sold. Other times, these animals are illegal to keep like protected dolphins, turtles, out-of-season fish, or even seabirds. Collectively, this is known as bycatch. The amount of bycatch varies widely by fishery and type of fishing gear. Where it's a problem, it creates waste in commercial and recreational fisheries, which makes some fisheries less sustainable and can affect jobs. It can also have unintended consequences, like impeding the recovery of protected species that get caught or entangled in fishing gear. The bottom line is that we need to tackle bycatch, and NOAA Fisheries and our partners are working on innovative ways to avoid it such as developing and promoting gear designs that exclude non-targeted species, monitoring bycatch hotspots to help fishermen steer clear, and educating anglers on how to safely release their unwanted catch. Together, we're working to get bycatch back into the sea where it belongs. It's why the U.S. is a global leader in sustainability, and U.S. caught seafood is a smart choice. Find out more about how we're addressing bycatch at fisheries.noaa.gov. Yeah, so kind of again highlighting um, different ways and methods that are kind of starting to get into like there's a lot of solutions and there's a lot of work. Um, there's definitely improvement that can always be done. I think that um, one of the other earlier videos said that like sustainable fisheries is kind of an ongoing process and it is. Um, and so this is just always something we can improve on and it's complicated. There's a lot of different uh, people that are involved in it and um, bycatch is something, there's a lot of technology and um, like gear and things like that that are being used to prevent. So you saw in that video, like you saw the turtle kind of went up against a uh, kind of a grate and that's called a turtle exclusion device. And so um, it was able to, it kind of wasn't able to go further into the net and it was able to kind of swim up and out, um, which is pretty cool. And so there's lots of different gear like that. They're looking at fit different types of fishing hooks, whether you use circle hooks instead of J hooks. There's lots of different methods um, to try to reduce that um, and kind of get an idea. Um, and there's all these kind of other issues that I'm not going to, I don't want to, um, uh, harp too much on all these because I want to focus more on the solutions and a lot of the um, things that we can uh, do with this. And I think one of these really interesting, there's a, this next video is talking about um, kind of also how this can tie so, uh, some of this technology and work and how it can tie to solutions um, and including with like carbon, um, carbon emissions and like how we can uh, bring this all together to also fight climate change with the oceans. We're going to have a story space ad first, though. Sorry, everyone. There we go. Skip ads. <laughs> For 3 million people around the world, seafood provides a significant source of protein and nutrition. But recent studies show that 33% of wild fisheries are overfished, while another 60% are fished at their maximum capacity. In fact, over half the seafood we eat, from fin fish and shellfish to seaweed and algae, isn't caught in the wild. It's grown through aquaculture, or aquatic farming. Farmed seafood is one of the fastest growing food industries, expanding in volume by 5.8% each year. But different methods of aquaculture come with different advantages and issues, some of which echo the serious problems we've seen in industrial agriculture. So how can we avoid repeating the mistakes we've made on land at sea? What aquaculture approaches are we currently using and what does a sustainable way to farm the ocean really look like? One of the most common aquaculture methods involves large pens made of nets where fish are farmed offshore in floating cages, roughly a thousand square meters in size. Commonly employed off the coast of Chile and in the fjords of Norway, these fish, like many industrially farmed animals, occupy stressful, overcrowded pens. 
They produce massive amounts of waste, polluting the surrounding areas and potentially spreading diseases to wild species. Worse still, since the antibiotics employed to fight disease aren't fully absorbed by the fish, they get excreted back into the environment. Net pens are also susceptible to escapes, unleashing huge numbers of fish which compete for resources and weaken the local gene pool with genes adapted for captivity. Escaped fish can even disrupt local ecosystems as invasive species. Other techniques, such as man-made coastal ponds commonly used for shrimp farming in Southeast Asia, create additional environmental problems. Just like net pens, these ponds are prone to spreading pollution and disease. Their construction also frequently destroys important ecosystems like mangroves and marshes, which protect coastal areas from storms, provide habitats, and absorb tons of greenhouse gases. One way to solve these problems is to farm fish on land in completely contained systems. Tanks and raceways can recirculate and filter water to prevent pollution. But even fully contained facilities still contend with another major hurdle, fish meal. About 10% of the seafood caught globally is used to feed animals, including carnivorous farmed fish. Researchers are working on fish feed made of insects and plant-based proteins, but for now, many inland fish farms are connected to overfishing. All these obstacles can make sustainable aquaculture feel a long way off, but innovative farmers are finding new ways to responsibly farm the seas. The most promising solution of all may be to look lower on the food chain. Instead of cramming large carnivorous fish into pens, we can work with natural ocean systems to produce huge amounts of shellfish and seaweeds. These low maintenance flora and fauna don't need to be fed at all. In fact, they naturally improve water quality, filtering it as they feed off of sunlight and nutrients in the seawater. By absorbing carbon through photosynthesis, these farms help battle climate change and reduce local ocean acidification while creating habitats for other species to thrive. Shifting to restorative ocean farming could provide good jobs for coastal communities and support healthy plant and shellfish-based diets that have an incredibly low carbon footprint. In just five months, 4,000 square meters of ocean can produce 25 tons of seaweed and 250,000 shellfish. With the right distribution network, a series of small farms collectively the size of Washington State could feed the planet. Farms like these are already popping up around the globe, and a new generation of farmers is stepping up to pursue a more sustainable future. Done properly, regenerative ocean farming could play a vital role in helping our oceans, our climate, and ourselves. If overfishing continues at its current rate, will the ocean ever run out of fish? Check out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a video actually that um, will be, the next video is also something that um, Virginia will link to and the comments, I think it's towards the end of the presentation, if I remember correctly, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, um, I like that video because it kind of pulls a lot of things together. It also highlights some of the aquaculture um, stuff that I haven't really talked too much about. Um, and so kind of looking for these creative solutions, um, I think is really important in fisheries. And I think you'll see that there is a lot of um, these creative solutions that are being um, researched and implemented and um, throughout throughout the world and the United States. And so it's kind of, um, so it's really great to kind of see these things being implemented because it, it's really important for jobs and um, fish too. Um, so lots of different, uh, lots of potential solutions, like different solutions depending on where you are um, and what works. Um, stock assessments, so just kind of look, researchers are really uh, needing to gain more research on how many fish are out there. Um, and that's really um, important to know with that, with the biological information, ecological information to know then, you know, how many fish can we take um, from the ocean and still have fish later, you know, so that way um, those fisher people can have, you know, their great grandchildren can also fish from the ocean and get that um, either for, you know, their livelihood or food because, you know, um, a lot of people love eating fish. It was three billion, three billion, something like that, um, that they had mentioned in one of the videos. Um, so it's a lot of people eating fish. And so kind of getting that there's, you can have observers that are fisheries observers that they go, people, scientists that go out on the boats and they 
um, record data on what's being caught. Um, and that also can be done on the dock side too. So when the boats come back to land, um, you can have uh, kind of scientists taking notes there and kind of just collecting that data. The more data we know, the better it's going to be for um, understanding that, getting these eco, um, ecosystem approaches we talked about, um, and that's the Magnuson-Siemens Act, Siemens Act and um, a lot of other different really important uh, uh, like policies and, and laws like this um, will help us kind of have a full approach um, to kind of saving and maintaining these uh, fish. Um, social impact analysis is also really important for lots, um, lots of different kind of anything environmental impact statements and things like that. So it's really important to do thorough um, social impact analyses um, for moving forward for different policies and laws as we go then as we um, move forward with uh, fisheries and fisheries management. And there's a ton of other things, right? We can limit the catch. We can talk about the seasonality. We can talk about like, you know, um, the, like, like we mentioned the gear and invasion. Um, so, you know, where can you fish? When can you fish? Like that sometimes is different. Um, and so uh, how much you can keep it catch, uh, what size of the fish you can catch, um, all these kind of things are all things that are already being implemented. And there's also, certification programs that uh, we talk about traceability. So, you know, we want to make sure we know, like, it's important to know where the fish come from. And um, so that way we know that it's coming from in some place that is, has a healthy stock. So a healthy population of fish. And so it's really important to make sure that we have these programs that go um, and support these programs that are attempting to fix this problem of fish that kind of flies on the radar that we don't actually know. And so if it gets to the market and it says it's a cod, but really it's, you know, something else, like that's a problem because um, it's being marketed as one thing as the other. And so that's a problem. I mean, you know, I'd be kind of upset. <laughs> um, and also like, it just has like that, you know, then that means that there's that loss in that kind of that data that we talk about, you know, that that's really important that uh, scientists have that. And so we want to make sure that we, are improving that too. So there's all of these things are being um, worked on by scientists and it's um, and policy managers and you know ocean nonprofit groups and fisher people and all of these like um, and people who love fish and cooks. I know that I know the marine um, the marine sanctuary last week did a, a kind of a webinar series on a sustainable fisheries and they had a chef and he was the one that was talking about sustainable fisheries. It was really interesting talking about locality and like what, you know, what's good to get when and also pairing, and then he also was pairing it with like, uh, you know, foods that were in season in that area. And so it was really interesting kind of, um, talk and I highly recommend looking at, uh, the marine sanctuaries, uh, uh, sorry, Marine Sanctuary's website for different educational resources too. It's really, really awesome. Um, and we talk about like marine protected areas, um, national monuments and national sanctuaries um, are important um, because you know, if you have an area that, you know, the fish, there's limited like fishing in it or there's, uh, yeah, limited fishing or no fishing in it, then those, in those areas and protecting those ecosystems, then the fish can uh, kind of, have an area to grow and keep doing their fish things. And, <laughs> um, and then there you have like a, kind of what we call a spillover effect, right? So then there's areas when you, if you can fish outside of those areas, this is like beneficial for fishers um, because they can, you know, have this like high, nice, healthy population that they're taking from. They know that it's, they're going to be able to um, replenish that. And so it's like, it's renewable resource, which is really, really important. Um, Yes, Kelsey, I see that you said isn't shrimp uh, fishing really bad and trawling. Um, yeah, that is one of the, you know, there's a lot of improvements that could be made. Shrimp fisheries are challenging in a lot of ways just because they're so small. Um, and sometimes the fish, like fishing methods that we use are a little, can destroy habitat or um, as you saw in some of them, they also have a lot of bycatch. And so catching things that they just don't want to catch with them um, and so kind of, you know, advocating for better methods um, and kind of 
you know, smaller methods as far as like how we manage that. And um, there's, we'll get to some good resources too that you can kind of check to see where you can get maybe um, some better shrimp fishery, um, like shrimp fish, if that's, or shrimp, if that's what you want. Shrimp are not a fish, they're an invertebrate. Just, um, so um, <laughs> when we say fisheries, it gets really complicated because we say fisheries and, you know, there's fish that, you know, have a backbone and gills and all of that. But then we also say fishery and when we say like clams and shrimp and things like that, but it's not, so it's, it's just, it's not, it's again, it's like that fishing effort, it's people, it's the gear, it's things like that. And so it's, um, they're not fish, but they are something that we consume um, and they come from the ocean. And so we kind of have this all encompassing uh, term that kind of can get confusing. So I just don't want anyone to get confused. Shrimp are not fish. <laughs> they are invertebrates, no background. Um, so yeah, there's some really cool technology though I, that uh, researchers and, um, you know, that you can even get, like that researchers use, that policymakers use, that even you can go on the internet and kind of explore and see these different tools that are open resource and um, able to see this. So this is an example of, this is a screenshot from um, Global Fishing Watch and their Skywatch. And so there's um, most registered boats, they should have a kind of, um, like a GPS tracker system. And so that can be actually highlighted on a map. Um, and so this is kind of really cool. You can watch this in almost near, near-ish, like within like a week um, time and seeing where fishing boats are. Um, and when we talk about, you might hear sometimes in, you know, ocean stuff and things like that. Um, but you have uh, these exclusive economic zones, which is 200 nautical miles off. And so that's what you see these green lines on this map um, are that area. So that's four. So the United States has theirs, you know, this goes up here. This is the United States. And then you have Mexico's um, exclusive economic zone. And then the Caribbean it kind of gets a little bit more complicated when you have island nations that are next to island nations. And so how does 200 miles look? And so um, it gets a little complicated there. And that's, you know, this is where we talk about like how internationally this is all influenced. Cause then you also have a beyond these uh, borders and what's managed within each country, you have what's the high seas. And so you see on this map that there's fishing vessels out in the high seas and no one's, um, that's like not necessarily like there's no one country, there's no like one rule for a lot of it. So. So a lot of different things that can happen as far as um, you know how we're fishing and things like that, and that's why international like you know um, agencies and coming together and like countries working together is super important for the oceans and ocean conservation. As I'm sure many of you know, right? We talk about like plastic pollution and things like that. Like we're a big component of that, I and mean, why like it is ending up in other countries. You know, there's things that, um, you know, and so fisheries is the same way. Like, you know, there's all these fishing effort and um, yeah. So it's just, just kind of a really cool tool. And then also I'm gonna give a shout out to the Migratory Connectivity Ocean Project. Um, this is something at Duke University, the Marine Geospatial and Ecology Lab. They have an open source tool. It's just really cool because this is talking about, um, this kind of gives an idea of where a lot of I mean, like marine mammals, sea turtles, sharks, seabirds, where are they going? Like, where are they migrating? Where are their breeding grounds? Where are they feeding? Because this is really important when we think about any kind of ocean conservation and fisheries management or, you know, just general ocean conservation for these animals and better understanding because fish don't like boxes. Like, no, most animals don't like boxes. We love to sometimes just draw these lines on maps, but like, they're not going to stay in that. And so this is kind of an open source resource, which is really cool, um, that tries to show those connections so we can have a better idea. And it's again, using tracking data from those animals. And so we were like, okay, cool. We have, you know, so many of this, like a green sea turtle that goes from point A to point B, like, and now we know where they go. And so 
kind of get a better idea and then how do we, you know, and then we can also then put that with other data like from Global Fishing Watch and say, okay, well, where are the fishing vessels? And are those, is that a conflict of interest? Is that within United States, like, um, like exclusive economic zone? What, what can the United States do? Is that international? Then what can the, what can we do as, you know, the United Nations has all these organizations like that they, how do they then work forward to like finding these solutions? So it gets complicated. Um, but it's, what's really cool though, is that there's a lot of people working on this with a lot of different solutions. So, um, I want to first kind of open up to you all and like kind of get an idea of what do you think you can do? Um, there's lots of different things before I give my list. Um, but I want to go ahead and give you a few, few seconds to type in to that chat box and see, um, if there's anything you can think of that you're like, man, what can I do? Eat sustainably fished. Yeah, absolutely. A few more seconds. Ask where my seafood comes from. Yeah, absolutely. Eat less seafood, support local fishers. Great, yes. Awesome. Yeah, those are great responses. And absolutely, eating sustainable fishing, knowing where your food comes from is huge. Um, and so, yeah, and supporting kind of like more locally based too, right? If you go, you know, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to let you live near a like coastal community that you can like go walk up to the dock and talk to the fishers, like directly from the source, you know, um, that's really great. Um, also, I was gonna say where my food comes from. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, support local fisheries, yeah. So, and also educate yourself, right? So this is like, you know, um, getting to kind of nerd out about fisheries here. Like this is really great. And there's lots of really good resources. I'll share some of them too. There's um, some fun on, like there's an online like fishing game. If you wanna, wanna go and like pretend like you're a fisher and kind of see like how many can you take. There's also, I have, I'm gonna, um, Virginia's gonna hand out like a, uh, it's like a, Kind of fishing at home even like kind of with your own in your own home and like different devices you kind of come up with uh kind of imitating fishing right even if you live in the middle of the united states it's definitely something you can do online guys so it's kind of cool to kind of do that um fun different things um yeah and so you can share what you learn right so that's kind of a big part too is kind of talking about that asking where your food comes from um, you can volunteer with an ocean conservation group, right? There's uh, lots of different, um, or a, like a local aquarium, things like that. There's lots of opportunities to help with uh, the ocean and what you can do um, with that. Uh, there's also community science projects, right? So um, sometimes they're also called citizen science projects, right? So always you look out for things like that. And a lot of those um, um, projects, you know, sometimes may have something that you can get involved with, and whether that's with fisheries or oceans or anything, you know, sometimes there's some projects about pollinators and things like that. So always a really cool way to kind of nerd out about things in science. Um, yeah, so like, I really want to like set a measurable goal for like buying sustainable, like for buying more sustainable seafood, right? Because, you know, we all got to start somewhere. And so figure out like, what's in your, you know, you keep, um, what, where you're at, where like your, how much like knowledge you have and kind of figure out like, okay, what do I need to learn? What do I want to do? What can I accomplish, you know, in the next week? What can I accomplish, you know, in the next year? Things like that. And so kind of really focus on um, kind of thinking of that. Um, I see him shouting at shout outs for seafood watch. Don't worry, I'll get to that. Yeah. Um, cool. And um, I really also want to, well, so, uh, so with the measure seafood watch, make sure you're also, like, there's also like some um, like certifications and things like that you can look at um, for seeing if it's actually uh, sustainably caught and things like that. And there's, you can look into like what the measurement is for those um, companies. Um, so I don't know why the bullet point got moved, but what I really want to emphasize is lean into your skill set and participate in a way that you can, right? You guys are all rock stars and you have your own way of doing this. And so what, figure out what it is. If you like love art, do like, you could do something with art. You can do something, you know, with science, you can do something with math. Like there's so many different skill sets and really awesome. And it's what's, um, I hope what you like take away from this 
presentation is that like it's all connected it's so connected the ocean's connected like fisheries are connected it doesn't matter where you live it's you're gonna it's all gonna kind of boil down come back to the ocean um and so you can have an impact and so really really um you know lean to your skill set and um do what you can there um yeah and so there are actually like a lot of really great resources that have um a can either online you can like search and like look up like what kind of fish it is and like where uh where does it come from if it's sustainable things like that so there's a lot of really good resources and uh as katie and Magda already mentioned in the chat like uh seafood watch is a most known one um and there's an app for it as well which is really great and these are um it's also science-based right there's a group a team of scientists that are constantly looking at those stock assessments that i mentioned so like looking at how many fish there are in the oceans um, and then working with fishers and kind of what came the gear and reducing the amount of bycatch. Remember that um, not catching or making sure we're catching what we want, um, which is really, really important. So, yeah, so those are kind of things that you can always look up. Um, and that kind of helps with that, you know, that step of uh, getting that, starting that knowledge and leaning your skill set and your utilize the resources that you can, you can use. Okay. So, with that, I will take any questions. I think I might have missed I might have missed one or two things in the chat. Um, so yeah, I will take any questions or thoughts, comments. Yeah. Do I work with fisheries every day? It's a great question. Um, I don't currently, I really would love to. Um, it's something I'm really passionate about and I would really love to. I currently, I'm working with like kind of doing, I'm actually leaning into a little bit um, while I'm at home a lot, I'm learning, leaning into doing some art and science communication in that way. Um, so that's what I'm currently working on, on like communicating those uh, marine conservation issues. But yeah, I, um, I love fisheries just cause so connected. So we're working with people too. It's like great. <laughs> Lots of really interesting challenges and uh, yeah, it's really, really awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to cover with fisheries. <laughs> I'm gonna put a couple resources in the chat for you guys too um, that Katie has shared with me. So hopefully those links will work for you but yeah well thanks virginia uh lily i see your comment yes uh are fish species going extinct from fisheries yeah so there's some it depends on you know it depends uh, oh yes i would say that they, like yes there are but i think that there's a lot i think because of that we're um we're making changes to prevent that right and so um I would say that there's like definitely there's been at least there's been close to extinction right um and so like let's see here what's an example um like well i mean so in that video we're talking about like you no know, like they uh, talked about like how there's a lot you can look at noah's website on like um a couple of fisheries that they have bounced back right so talking about like when we say collapse fisheries it means it's really like close to extinction and not something that we can sustainably take from. And so, um, yeah, so then like, then they, we like with our management and policies and laws and, and, and people advocating for more sustainable fisheries, we've been able to like bounce back and working with um, fishers because they want, they want to sustain like sustainable fisheries too, right? So, um, and also Zane, hi Zane, I saw, you let me scroll up. I saw you had a question, how do fisheries and sharks go together? Yeah, great question. Um, so many ways. So, you know, sharks, uh, there's, you know, there's, they can be caught as bycatch. So they are sometimes not intended. Um, so like for like long line fishery, you know, with tuna, um, they might actually get uh, a bunch of sharks on their lines instead. It's like something, sometimes fishers will call it like shark, they get, like get sharked out. Um, and, you know, and that's at times that also means that, you know, they want that gear back, but if they're all their lines are sharks and it's heavy and it takes a lot of time, sometimes they'll cut the lines. So that ends up with like hooks in their mouth. And that's by no means is like, that's 
not what a fisher wants to do, but you have, they have to weigh the time of like, how much fuel do we have? What do we have left? We need to be able to get back and like, you know, the energy of their crew to like haul in all of those sharks. Um, and so then, um, so that's a Canadian impact sharks. Uh, there are actual shark fisheries as well. And so that varies throughout the world. Um, so you have some dogfish fisheries um, that are off the coast of New, um, the, of New England, wow. Um, you know, and so those are sometimes, so there's some more sustainable shark fisheries because um, sharks are very different, but there's also very unsustainable shark fisheries, right? So we talk, I think, you know, we could probably, um, you know, part of shark finning and uh, taking the shark fins for, um, you know, shark fin soup and things like that. And so, you know, there's high value for the fins, but the rest of the shark isn't used. And so there's different, um, so fisheries are really con connected in that. And then also, you know, when we're fishing too much, or if we fish a certain species, you know, we're going to also, that's different. I mean, there's what, 500, over 500 species of sharks. So like, and they range everywhere in the ecosystem from the top, you know, to the middle, like everywhere. And so you, you know, these predators are really important. And so you're also taking their food. And so that also can negatively impact, which is why it's important. Um, they're really important to regulate kind of the ecosystem and understand like, you know, to keep everything in check. Um, and so that's why when we remove sharks and shark fisheries in an unsustainable way, that's a problem. Um, yeah, so great question. But yeah, they super connected. You go on and on about that. Um, but those are the big, the big ones. All right, let's see here. What are other questions? Uh, are there some spe fish species that are oops, oh, popped up? Hold on, sorry. More than just others. So what are they? Yeah, great questions. Okay, so um, let's see here, trying to think of how to uh, make sure that I'm answering all of them. Um, are some fish species more endangered than others? Uh, yes, there are. And I can't really speak to um, which ones on what they are, but I really encourage you to, because there are so many different types of fisheries. Um, and so, you know, I, that's, I would encourage you to kind of look into that more on what um, fisheries are out there. Um, and, you know, you have some deep sea fisheries um, that, you know, maybe are not doing as well. Like, this is one of my also favorite things about like, uh, when we talk about seafood fraud and like, um, also like this perception of like, when we start selling things that are, um, we call, used to call them one thing and now we remarketed it to call it something else. So there's a deep sea fish called um, uh, the orange ruffy, um, which that, I believe that species is, endangered it's a slow growing it's deep sea fish it's like um it's slow growing and so when we started fishing that that became an issue um i'm not sure what their current status is um but they used to be called a slime head <laughs> it's like orange slime head or something but obviously no one's gonna want to eat a slime head so they were like orange roughy um same goes with the patagonian uh, toothfish it's now the chilean sea bass even though it's not a sea bass um so it's really interesting kind of how we choose words and like why that's important, because um, it, yeah, it matters. <laughs> um, yes, I believe also the shark fin soup is also less popular now. There's still, I'm not sure what the current status is on how much finning is, and there's a lot of fin bans and things like that um, that are happening, and that's also working with international, um, you know, communities and things like that. So it's, you know, there's lots of really big wins. I think uh, this, yeah, this year there's a, a fin ban. United States, um, which is great. And I know Oceana worked really hard on that. Um, so, which is really cool. Uh, let's see here. How do we work with foreign fisheries and yeah, and our over, US fisheries overfishing? Yeah, so um, that's a complicated question in general, um, just because, you know, uh, we just continue working with them by, by advocating for um, either on the local level really helps. And then um, if it's something you're really interested in, you know, like looking into that international realm and like policy and things like that, working together with 
um, them because the United Nations, there's lots of working groups that work on these issues um, with representatives from all over the world, um, trying to figure out what those solutions are. Um, and so, yeah, great question. Those are, um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes we're fishing at the max because that's just, um, you know, they can, and if that means, and it's also like, you know, they're talking about like, if you get into like economics a little bit and like they can get more money, right? So if they can go out and fish as much as they can, you know, if it's a large fishing corporation, they're gonna fish as much as they can because they have the technology and it makes sense for them because it's like a business, right? And so um, that's why there's coming up with like creative solutions and like, you know, advocating for like marine protected areas or, you know, f catch limits and things like that are really important. Um, do, 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 do. Oops, sorry trying to scroll through the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, that's the, so as far as like cuts lines full of sharks, uh, that's just something that I've heard from a friend that's a fisheries observer that that has happened at times. I am not going to, I don't want you to think that that when there's a bunch of lines um, like sharks that they always do that. Like they for sure will hold them up and try to get their hook out. Cause again, like it's in their effort cause they don't want to spend money on you know, all that fishing line hook. And so they don't also want to do that. So um, I don't want to, um, I want to make sure that that's clear, like that that has happened. There's lots of, but there's, it's not necessarily, that's not the norm, right? So I want to make sure that's really um, emphasized, you know, and uh, fishers are part of a lot of these groups and working together on finding these solutions and gear and like gear modification and um, working with this. So yeah, super important. Um, uh, these pieces stinked by bycatch. That's a great question. I don't, I see turtles have a lot of, um, yeah, um, sea turtles face a lot of issues, you know, and bycatch is one of them. I don't know in particular if there's like sea turtles, if there's a direct correlation as far as like bycatch are the biggest impact for sea turtles. Someone who studies sea turtles would know better than I would, but that's a great question. We should definitely look into that. There's a sea turtle talk in two weeks. Oh, awesome. Adam, so come to that one and we oh, can ask him. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely go to that one and ask him because I'm not sure, but that, yeah, sea turtles face so many problems sometimes. So <laughs> the poor guys. So yeah, two weeks. Cool. Check out Adam's talk then. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah, Jacqueline, and, put, and there's a really fun book out there. Um, so check that out talking about bluefin tuna and how they used to be used for uh, dog food, things like that. Cool. Yeah, and technology using like helicopters and spotter planes, things like that. Um, yeah, lots of technology out there using to catch fish, so. Oh, um, well, we'll hang out for another minute or two if that's yeah. okay with you, Katie, but I'm yeah. gonna go ahead and throw um, sign up links in the chat. Next week, um, we have two really cool presentations. The first one is all about like, zoos and wildlife sanctuaries and um, whether or not it's like a good idea to go to those. So if you watched like Tiger King and you want to see like how that relates to the real world, that'll be really fun with Maggie. And then Becca is going to talk about freshwater conservation. So if you have some more questions about like sustainable fisheries and um, like how to help conserve those efforts, um, that's going to be with Becca. So I'll throw those signups in the chat as well as a sign up for the newsletter in case you're not already getting that because that's where you can also rewatch this presentation and also watch past presentations. Um, but Katie, this is so great. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for everything. And thank you everyone for participating and uh, being active in the chat and everything. And yeah, thank you. You guys have been great. This has been so much fun. Thanks, Katie. All right. Hi, Veronica. <laughs>